This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 271, recorded on February 7th, 2014. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. I just noticed today is 2714. 2 times 7 equals 14. How about that for a pattern? That's pretty good, Vincent. Pretty Joining good. me today right here in the TWIV studio, you heard it, those dulcet tones, Dixon de Palmier. Hello, Vincent. Uh, oh, you sound great. You must have a I've got virus. something. I've got something. You need some antibiotics for those viruses? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe a little bit of... Uh, Tamof- tamoxifen or no tamoxifen is something totally different <laughs> i'm just guessing <laughs> tammy flu right? that's what i meant to say um the, the person sitting next to you is also right here in studio uh-huh. sent me a cartoon of what was it robin about to tell batman that he, he wanted antibiotic for his cold and he and batman was slapping him saying it's a virus stupid <laughs> that's right <laughs> so uh also joining us today right here in the twiff studio ashley bennett Hey guys. Welcome back. Did you miss Twiv for like three weeks? Um, I think it was only two weeks. Two weeks. You're back with uh, some Coursera stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How is it out there in the hinterlands? Oh, uh, it's not too bad today. It's uh, cold, um, minus two Celsius, uh, oh. 29 Fahrenheit. Bet you have a lot of snow on the ground, right? We have a whole bunch of snow. We got, uh, right. well, I don't know, thirty centimeters or snow or so, and I had to had to chisel through Mount Snowplow at the foot of the driveway. <laughs> and it, it was Mount annoying snowplow. too. I like it, that, <laughs> right? It, it, it was annoying too because it, it was sort of you know blizzard and then flurry and then blizzard and then flurry and it just wouldn't finish. So yep. when do you get around to shoveling the driveway? Right. Yeah. yeah, we had two snowstorms this week, and this, of course, was the week I had to be in early to teach medical students, so it was challenging. Today, it's zero degrees Celsius. Zero. Sunny, though. Very nice day, isn't it? Yeah, it looks nice. The hawks mm-hmm. are flying by the window. Right. They are. Yeah. They are. Also joining us from north central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Hello, Hello there. Rich. How's pizza? Uh, Pete's is just waiting for me. Uh, you know, uh, Dixon's going to Dixon's going to come down here, I heard and it. I'm going to take Dixon to Satchel's. There you, you go. There now, you Dixon, go. you may think pizza blah, but this is really no, good no. I, I'm a big. Fan. Uh, that's the whole thing is an experience. I'm a big fan. You know, uh, got to do this. When's the last My, time you went to Satchel's, Rich? Actually, it's been uh, weeks. I think has, I really, has Alan been down there? You know, fix. Alan has been down here, but he. He uh, sort of made a short visit. Uh. Okay, he didn't really have the right mind state for this. <laughs> yeah, the, the problem is that the graduate students uh, organized my trip there. Uh. So, and they went ahead and reserved at a uh, what turned out to be a very nice Cuban restaurant. I had a lovely meal, but um, just uh, you know couldn't couldn't fit in a trip to Satchel's. Yeah, you need to come down a day early so you can actually go to Satchel's. Right. It's worth so, it. by the way, this is important. It's 51 mm-hmm. degrees here, and yeah, very important, very <laughs> overcast, and that's 10.5 degrees Celsius. Okay. I'm uh, not real happy about the temperature. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll, I can handle it. Did you guys get zapped with that storm that swept through the south? Uh, well, the one that paralyzed Atlanta. Exactly. Oh, the one that paralyzed Atlanta. You know what? I was coming home from D.C. for that, <gasps> and it took me an extra day. I had to fly to Jacksonville day. instead of go through Atlanta. Uh, so, nah, we didn't really get zapped. It was no big deal. All right. Let's, uh, before we do Coursera, Ashley, I want to do mm-hmm. two follow ups. First, I want to mention uh, that Rich and I had the opportunity to meet Esmeralda at the biodefense meeting last week. She came up afterwards and wanted us to sign um, a book for her three year old who she said listens to Twiv with her. Wow. And uh, so the book is in the show notes, uh, the photos in the show notes. This is the Invisible ABCs. It's like a microbiology book for kids. So we signed it. Great. And this kid is the youngest Twiv listener, probably. <laughs> Does she yeah, use it to help record. put her to sleep? Uh, <laughs> maybe it puts the mother to sleep. I don't know. Um, 
uh, I think she, yeah, maybe, maybe she does. We have these soothing voices, you know. Yeah, there you go. So anyway, uh, she said she'd be listening, so a shout out to Esmeralda. Thank you. Uh, also, um, a company called Rev.com, R-E-V.com, has transcribed. They are a transcription service, and they transcribed for us an episode of TWIV, in particular number 261, Giants Among Viruses. Um, and so it's posted. You can check it out there. And we thank them for uh, donating that to TWIV. So check them out and Very nice. flood them with clicks. So, uh, and, you know, get something transcribed. So you like cool. put the transcription. Ah, there it is. Audio text transcription. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's the whole episode. I've, I picked uh, one with people with very heavy French accents to test their transcription <laughs> ability. <laughs> and they did very well. Uh-huh. Dixon, you can't be coughing here, okay? I'm going to try my best, but you know viruses are viruses. You, you got Ashley right next to you. It's not fair to I, give her what you got. I even offered you the strain of virus for your culture. I don't want it. <laughs> All right, Ashley, what's up with Coursera this week? So, um, I guess it was a couple weeks ago, we um, posted another Join the Conversation discussion group, which is designed to encourage students to talk um, about virology-related topics relevant to their lives um, and stimulate a uh, conversation that they might have if they were in person. And that particular week, I think we were talking about um, transmission. Oh, and you, you mean like six-speed, five-speed? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, automatic uh, manual. Yep. Transmission of viruses. And you had a lecture slide where you talked about... Um, a mutation in the uh, CCR5 receptor, mm-hmm. which has been shown to lend some individuals resistance towards HIV infection. Um, this is more common in some human populations than others. So I uh, posed a little thought experiment for the students. I asked them um, if you could get tested for this, if it was affordable, and you could get tested, would you? Would you want to know if you carried this copies of this gene? And if you found out that you did have it and that you were therefore more resistant to HIV, would this pl- affect your sexual practices or your needle sharing practices? <laughs> needle sharing. I don't know how many heroin users we have <laughs> taking Coursera. But, you know, I just asked the students to do a little yeah. thought Maybe experiment. Maybe they should all take it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I uh, enjoyed watching the responses roll in. So, I'm probably sure. one, of, one of the first things I learned is that. Apparently, we have a lot of happily married um, Coursera users, <laughs> because I got a lot of responses of people saying, uh, yes, I would want to get tested, or no, I wouldn't want to get tested, but then they always follow that up with saying, but it wouldn't affect my sexual practices because I'm happily married. Yeah, As right. a matter of fact, some of the individuals even put happily married in bolds or in caps, <laughs> and uh and I was like, okay, I didn't, I didn't know we had such a strong, happily married contingent among our Coursera listeners. That's great. Uh, um, so we have sixteen thousand registered for this course, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, only one percent will ever respond at the most. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah, we, we we don't get uh, tons of responses. Probably get. So like, how many responses did you get? Probably around a hundred for okay. this question. Mm-hmm. A couple of people responded twice, and there were some good discussions that occurred. And I've been really pleased lately. Um, everyone has been very nice and cordial on the forums. So what fraction of those wanted to get tested? Um, a pretty high, uh, pretty high majority, I would say. I didn't go through and officially quantify the, the responses, but um, many of them said that they would like to get tested. Um, just did, did any of them say that it would change their behavior? No, but there was one guy who had responded earlier, and then later on, after a lot of responses had come in about six days later, he made another post, which I thought was pretty good. Um, He says, uh, his name is David Dionys, and he says, um, It may come as no surprise that people would not become reckless if an increased immunity would be present. However, um, as I read through these posts, it seems as if only extremely responsible people are commenting so far. (laughs) Right. And in a way, I wonder how far we can really perform this thought experiment. And he goes on to say, sexual arousal often takes this by surprise. And he um, <laughs> kind of poses a few scenarios where it's like, come on, people, let's be honest. Like, this could potentially <laughs> affect your practices. And um, 
So at least one person was willing to <laughs> was willing to be honest. Weighed into that, yeah. Well, you know the population taking a course online is probably not going to be your wildest population, you know. But that's fine. I mean, well, apparently this is what happily married people do um, at night. <laughs> so they're, they're, they're watching courses. virology Good to know. Good to know. Really? Yeah. It's its own form of birth control. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, I, I, as part of my testing at 23andMe, that, that's one of the tests they do. Yeah. And I'm totally susceptible to HIV. Uh-huh. I have the wild type CCR5 gene. Yeah, a couple um, individuals had also gone to 23andMe. Um, uh, Victor Stevens responded um, that he had looked into 23andMe. Um, of course, when it came to changing his sexual practices, uh, he says that depends on the potential partners, <laughs> and a new wardrobe and a time machine would be more effective than a mutation. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and, and many people um, just reiterated the fact that, uh, such as Louisa Warren, she says HIV isn't the only STD out there, so practicing safe sex is necessary. Chlamydia and gonorrhea can cause infertility if untreated. And the point is that other STDs come with their own bag of woes, so prevention is key. Um, And uh, another anonymous person wrote, just because you can't get HIV doesn't mean you can't get syphilis. Um, And also, there's an interesting discussion about whether or not this would make people more irresponsible. For instance, with the um, um, HPV vaccine, a lot of um, far, I'd hope to think it was just far white right-wingers were worried that with this vaccine, people would become more irresponsible. Um, so there's a little conversation on the side going on about that as well. Yeah. And that discussion also comes up in HIV vaccine development. Yes. Well, it's already uh, come up with regards to the triple therapy because uh, there are lots of young people now, young men at least, uh, in which HIV infection is on the rise. And they give as their excuse, it doesn't matter because I can be treated and that's that's a common theme now among uh, physicians that are treating that group of people. But the question is, would um, I mean that's their that's the excuse that they use for practicing right. unsafe sex. Exactly. But would they have done that anyway? Correct. Correct. Did this actually change their behavior? Exactly. Is that it? Um. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Okay. Um, unless you guys have any further comments. I have no, I have no further comments or questions. Cool, Senator. Exactly. <laughs> so, are you gonna put another one up? You've put one up this week. Uh, yeah, I put one up uh, this week. Uh, yeah, for last week's lecture on norovirus. Oh, cool. Oh, good. You're gonna hear that one next That's Friday. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. Great. I think Thank now you. it would be good to go do some mini preps. <laughs> uh, I don't have mini preps, but I do have a gel running okay. that I need to go check on. So. Uh, good luck. Okay. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Great. Bye. See you, Ashley. Take care. I just turned you off by mistake, Dixon. That's okay. Oh, you're off. Hold on. I'm off. Back on. Okay. Now, okay. Thank you, Ashley. Um, Dixon. Yes, sir. I feel like you're a child that I have to reprimand all the time. Oh, stop it. Can you get close to the microphone, please? Well, you, you know, I don't want to contaminate it. But it's your <laughs> microphone. I, I know. I might catch it again. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, how long would a virus last on a foam microphone cover? A microphone? Yeah. That sounds like an experiment that needs I to be done. I think you you could do that one now because depends uh, on the virus. It depends <clears throat> on the virus. That's exactly you know, at right. these restaurants where people do karaoke, yeah. the mics are probably really contaminated, right? Karaoke. They, they, you know, th- uh, you, we you had this discussion a while ago <laughs> on, when I was absent. There's viruses. Everywhere. Yeah, there you go. There Keep you go. Up. There you Forget go. Forget it. You know, you know well, you're a pox virus Forget guy. It. Come on, that's it. That's, come on, everybody knows about that one. And karaoke microphones. I mean, what concentration of alcohol fumes is getting breathed across? Those? <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. To right. do that, so you're rich. You know, yesterday I I talked to medical students about enteric viruses, including neuro, and I was talking about hand hygiene. And then one of them got me later, and he said, "There are viruses everywhere. What's the difference? Do we have to really wash our hands all the time?" I said, uh, yeah, you're, you're "Several vice rolls over in his grave again." I said, "Just when you go to the bathroom, really wash because." There's nothing worse than fecally contaminated hands. Right. Ah. You know, there are certain circumstances where this makes sense, in particular in a hospital setting, where you're encountering high concentrations of 
uh, contaminated fluids from one patient and then going and probing the uh, cavities of another patient. It makes sense to uh, wash your hands in between. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I'm not going to uh, go around being paranoid about doorknobs and subway handles and right. banisters and everything else that drive myself crazy. Right. Well, I think the key is you know, wash your hands before you eat or before yeah. you put your fingers in your eyes or, or something like that. And, you know, yeah, you put your hands wherever you put your hands. But before you put your hands in your mucous membranes or near them, then clean them off. Yep. <laughs> Makes sense to me. Okay. Uh, our main paper today was nominated by many, many listeners. There was a lot of buzz about this. Oh, <laughs> that's cool. I'm just getting started. Yeah. Oh, um <laughs> it was picked up in the press. The New York Times had an article. Many of the science uh, magazines had articles. And, uh, for example, Jesse Noor. Now, Jesse is a podcaster. He's a Ph.D. student in Alabama who does a podcast called Bacteriophiles. He wrote, Can This Be Real? Pathogenic Plant Virus Jumps to Honeybees. Sounds pretty radical to me. I'd be interested to hear a discussion from the experts at TWIV. Ask and you shall receive. Jim writes, um, I, he sent a link to an article, might be worth discussing. This is Jim from Virginia. Jacob writes, I recall somebody asking about evidence for a plant virus infecting an organism from another kingdom a while back. David Tribe has a nice article up about a plant virus that infects bees and might be a contributor to colony collapse disorder, as it seems, is anything associated with bees. <laughs> it's not really a zoonosis, perhaps a phytonosis, sticking with Greek. Lily writes, hello, this is Lily writing from Carbon, Alberta, where the weather is a balmy minus 14 C and the barometric pressure is 102 <laughs> kilopascals. Is that what PA is? Yeah. I've just read a fascinating article on how the tobacco ring spot virus has made the staggering evolutionary leap from plants to bees using the RNA and pollen to not just infest the GI tract of the bees, but to integrate itself fully into the cells of even their wings. Some even suggest that this may be the culprit behind hive collapse. Are you planning to cover this virus's evolutionary leap in the near future on your podcast? I'd love to hear your take on this issue. P.S. I'm a registered nurse at a federal penitentiary where control of virus transmission is a common concern. My husband got me onto your podcasts during a norovirus outbreak. The two-bucket disease is a true horror in prison. Oh, yes. He says that imagine. even though he is a philosopher, he does know the difference between a virus and a bacterium. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And another one from David. Can you include a segment about viridae that jump from plant to insect? Is there any evidence of a virus jumping from plant to animal? Stay tuned, David. <laughs> uh, yep. Then David had a long conversation with Kathy, apparently because... Well, you know, I never answer TWIV emails except on the on the show, so he was just, he had a long conversation, which I won't, won't recount. So, let's go to the videotape. Nobody's going to know what that's from. No, they're not. Maybe you and Rich Condon. Warner Wolf. Uh, it's, Warner a, Wolf. It, it's a familiar uh, phrase, but I don't know what it's from. It's from Warner Wolf. He used to say that on, what was he, a uh, commentator sports, or something? Sportscast. Let's go. So, let's sports go to the paper. Cast. It's an M-Bio paper. Everybody can read it. Yep. Systemic spread and propagation of a plant pathogenic virus in European honeybees, Apis mellifera. Right. It is from China, Beltsville, right. Maryland, North Carolina, and Beltsville, Maryland. Right. And many authors. The first author uh, is... Amory as well. Uh, as well. Amory. Uh, that is in Atlanta. The first author is Lee, and the last author is Chen. Yeah, so these guys, I believe, were on on the hunt for colony collapse. That's true. Causation, yep. and they're basically sequencing bees. You know, extracting from bees and purifying virus particles and sequencing them. Right. Because they say in the beginning, we we it was a serendipitous detection of this virus in honeybees. All right. Right. So they basically uh, take a lot of bees, about 50, and they grind them up, and they purify particles and they extract uh, the um, RNA, and they convert it to DNA and sequence it. And as they were doing this, they found the typical suspects. Uh, what's the uh, Israeli acute paralysis virus? Right. Um, oh, darn. What is DWV? 
deformed wing virus. Thank you. Uh-huh. And, uh, and also sack brood virus. I and love black, that one. Black queen <laughs> cell virus. I love the names. Ooh, yeah, yeah, they're great names. Black queen cell and sack brood. <laughs> Oh, I was By the way, I, I wanted to go back just a minute yes, to the sir. methods here because I love the methods. Go ahead. <laughs> yes. To get to we to to extract these viruses from bees, so they pull out a section of a hive, and they scrape fifty bees into a fifty mil conical tube. Right? That and itself they, is not so easy. Right, and then they flash <laughs> freeze them, flash freeze them in liquid nitrogen, and pulverize them to a powder. Yep. Right. Okay. Yep. Uh, there, and there are machines that you can get that do this that are cryogenic pulverizers. Right. Okay. And then they extract the uh, uh, powder with a pretty exotic buffer and spin out the big stuff and then filter that and they have a virus prep out the other end. Cool. Yep. I read this and I decided that's <laughs> what I want done with me. <laughs> when I'm all finished on this <laughs> earth. I want to be snap frozen in liquid nitrogen and pulverized to a fine powder. Uh You know, (laughs) low speed spin. I want the trash to go in the biohazard trash. Nice. And then I want you to sequence all the viruses. Cool. All right. Well, you know, it may not be up to you. (laughs) No, I, I can, I can write some sort of document saying what to do here. My guess is it'll turn out to be mostly phage. Um, they, it, it, this is a good point. They actually, the colony they used uh, was part of the USDA Bee Research Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland. So uh-huh. it's a single colony. It's not like it's all over the place, which probably is important. Yeah. All right, so they get clones and they start sequencing them. And as I said, they find a bunch of viruses known to be suspects. But they say 20% of the clones, N equals 10, uh, match the sequence of tobacco ring spot virus. Tobacco ring spot. Hmm. I wonder what kind of symptoms that virus causes on tobacco. <laughs> you know, that's the nice thing about plant viruses. They are great named names. in, in yeah. great names. So this is an RNA containing virus plus stranded. It has two uh, RNA pieces which are packaged separately. All right. So this I'm, is a two hit virus, Dixon. Yes, I'm right? glad I didn't read this paper oh. beforehand though, because I have some, You never do. I have I do so. Yes, I do. So I have a, 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 a basic question here, and that is, are they sure that the virus that they isolated from the bee prep... Well, you have a good question, but they didn't isolate any virus. Well, oh, from the bee prep? Yeah, from the okay. bee prep. Yes, go ahead. Sorry. was not from the pollen on the bees, but rather in the bees themselves. We're going to get to that. Good. Right, we'll get to it. Good. All right, these contamination good. issues are relevant. Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. okay. Uh, right. I, th- I, I want to point out... <laughs> that yeah, they didn't isolate virus. Yes. Well, right. the, it's not really proven that they isolated <laughs> virus. And in terms of the sequences they got, uh, they just got uh, they didn't uh, get the whole genome. That's right. Right. They got bits. Bits. Right. That's important. They didn't get the whole thing, and right. they didn't isolate any infectious virus. All right. So they got bits of the genome cloned. They looked at the samples, what they purified from the bees by electron microscopy, and they see particles, but there's no way to prove that that's TRSV. Right, because there's a whole bunch of other viruses viruses that could look like that. Some some of those probably are these other viruses. Yes, Mm -hmm. now the the electron micrograph, figure two, it says electron microscopy of TRSV particles from infected honeybees. I do not know how they can say that. I do not agree with that caption. No. Right. Now, this is the first exactly. of a few issues I have exactly. with this exactly. paper. Exactly. Yeah. And um, right. everyone who wanted commentary, we're going to give it. So, uh, <laughs> uh, this, off to the side here. Yes. Uh, this is a side point. One of the things I find striking is that all of these plus strand RNA viruses are basically the same theme. You know, a cluster of non-structural proteins and a cluster of structural proteins right. arranged different ways. In this case, it's in two segments. Yeah. In uh, some other viruses, the structural proteins come first, and then the non-structural proteins, some, it's the other way around. But, you know, there's got to be way back there 
some common as, uh, yeah. ancestor for yeah. just a, an enormous number of plus strand RNA viruses. Really yeah, interesting. I, I agree. I and it hadn't occurred to me, you're right, that, that I, I find it somehow fascinating that these two segments are uh, packaged in different particles and that would titrate with two hit kinetics, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so then... Um, so then they do some hmm. PCR. Yeah, so they make primers for this TR TRSV and do PCR in different tissues. And they're just looking for, you know, small fragments. The fragment they're looking for is 730 base pairs. Right, and this, by the way, is another place where it's fun to go to the methods. <laughs> and, and pity the poor schmuck who <laughs> pinned down 30 bees and dissected them, presumably under a dissecting microscope. And they, they explain, you know, they use small scissors to cut here, and they remove these organs and these. And they, they really take some care to try and separate these pieces of a bee, hmm. um, which cannot have been easy. Yeah. They look at a lot of different places, like hemolymph. Dixon, what's hemolymph? Hemolymph is a clear fluid. Thank you. Which circulates throughout the hemocele. Okay. They have no closed circulation. Bug oh. blood. Bug yeah, blood. bug blood. Bug well, blood. It's not really blood. Hemolymph, wings, legs, antennae, brain, fat bodies, salivary gland, gut nerves, trachea, and hypno hypopharyngeal gland. Right. All right. So they basically get a PCR product in everywhere except the eye. And That's it ranges it. in intensity. You mean in the omatidia? Well, they label it eye, man. <laughs> Is that what it's called, the omatidia? Well, the individual segments of the okay. eye of a compound eye are called an omatidia. Right, but they, they took off the whole compound eye. and right. Right. So this says there are sequences there. It doesn't tell you how much because this is not quantitative. Right. Uh, and um, one thing I would have liked to see is a negative... Control. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, I was kind of disturbed by that. Too. Uh -huh. You know, there are no controls in this paper. <clears throat> uh, they should have a buffer control to make sure the reagents aren't contaminated, etc. Right, I mean, this they, they, the eye sample is negative, but as they point out in the text, apparently there's prior work that shows that there might be inhibitors mm. in in insect eyes that that would prevent. RT-PCR amplification, so that that could be the reason the eye is negative. But yeah, huh. a, a good negative control would be nice here. I mean, we learned from the XMRV story that PCR can be highly misleading. <laughs> yes. Get to say yes. It. So I think a negative control is in order. Um, I am actually surprised that they would detect it in every, almost every location. It's weird. It's yeah. very weird. Yeah. I think it would be really hard to dissect a bee in this fashion Maybe. and not get cross-contamination of the tissues. But you could get some pieces like legs and wings... You could take off fairly easily, although how do, you, how do you make sure there's no hemolymph in the leg or the wing, mm -hmm. which has circulation of this fluid? Um, so yeah, there there could be there could be cross contamination. So it raises another question then: with arboviruses, uh, for instance, would you find the arbovirus in all the tissues as a control for how generalized is the viremia and the viral infection in uh, a classic? Uh, insect transmitted virus. In the insect, you mean? Yeah, exactly. I don't think you find it everywhere. That's a good question. I do not believe you find it in every tissue. Because I think hemolymph would be a, the number one, and since it circulates over all the organs... It would bring virus everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So it could be, you're saying, yeah. Dixon? Yeah, yeah, it's possible. But again, if this, if they did a quantitative PCR or some other kind of quantitative assay, you it would go some way toward addressing that, because a, exactly. you know, a little bit of hemolymph right, on a leg, right. you'd expect to see a tiny trace of it. But here you've just got all sure. these bands, with the exception of the kind of low levels in the... Um, I guess the gut and the muscle. Yeah. Uh, those are distinctly low, but the others are, are all kind of binary. Right. What I would have liked to have seen is in situ hybridization. Uh, ha. Right? Yes. Cut ha. the bees ha. and hybridize a probe. Let's see where it is. Right. Yeah. So right. we don't have that. We have it for another organism, as you'll see, but not for the bees, which is really weird in yeah. my view. And did they do the bees' knees? <laughs> yeah, they did, Dixon. The now, bees um, knees. Next, they look for negative stranded viral RNA. So when these plus stranded RNA viruses get into cells, in order to produce more genomes, they make a negative strand and then they copy it to make a plus strand. So if you can find negative strands, it's a good indication that the virus is replicating. 
Now, we have attempted this experiment many times. <laughs> By PCR in particular, it is extremely difficult. It's very hard to do strand-specific PCR for reasons that I don't need to get into. So they do it with these same tissues, and they detect negative-stranded RNA in many tissues, pretty much paralleling the the uh, plus strand or the, the total PCR that we just discussed. Oh, I think. Right. Now, missing also, here controls are extremely important. So the way the negative strand PCR, it's done in a funny way with a labeled primer, a tagged primer. And so you make a primer that's complementary to the negative strand that has a tag on it, and then you amplify the tag in the subsequent cycles. Oh. We have tried this, and we could never get it to work with our viruses, it's important to show a control that it is specific for negative strands and not mm. just amplifying plus strands. Uh, right. you know, so in our hands, that's what happened. Got it. And they don't show that here. This is a really serious hmm. limitation of this experiment in figure four. Yeah. So I, don't, I do not know why the reviewers didn't pick this up and say you have to do this because I would have said you have to do this experiment because this is not conclusive. Did you mention the journal? In the beginning? It didn't. It's M-Bio. 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 And this is a, is a good journal, and I am an editor, sure, actually, sure, and I did not sure. handle this paper, hmm. just so you know. <laughs> I would have asked them to do the experiment. This is not a hard experiment. But anyway, so I'm not sure this negative strand is conclusive. In my view, it is not conclusive. Hmm. So I do not ha see that there is proof that this virus <coughs> is replicating. And, of course, I would like them to get infectious virus out of here also. Yeah. Are you sure. okay, Rich? I'm okay. I'm here. All right. <laughs> uh, Everything's fine. I'm just agreeing with everything you say. We well, don't have to, but that's just my... <laughs> but I do. I do. We have yeah. tried this because the R virus goes through a negative strand, and it's we can't get we still can't get it to work. Huh. Now, we could just be inept, and I, I totally... But you have to show the, the controls. Our controls, when we did it, showed that we were amplifying... Inept. Yeah, we were inept. <laughs> inept. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, so uh, I think the negative strand is inconclusive. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, they give this ranking of concentration. Uh, I just don't believe it because uh, there are no controls. The next experiment they do, they look at the varroa mite. Dixon, you know the varroa mite? This is a mite that oh, sucks yes, 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 hemolymph yes, yes, out yes, of bees. Yes, 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 I do. Tasty. You think you had a problem dissecting bees? <laughs> yeah. That's right, that's right. This guy is like one and a half to two millimeters long. Right. It's but a little guy. Infestations of mites are yeah, they, yeah. huge. They're cute. Well, there's, a nice wi there's a nice wiki page on them. Huh. And varroa mites, you know, we've done a couple of papers on colony collapse and TWIB. Uh, yeah. And varroa mites have been implicated in have. Uh, various viruses and fungi in, in addition. So they here they section the varroa mites because the mites are, you know, are, are implicated in um, transmitting viruses to the bees and they hybridize it with a, an, a probe for this virus, tobacco ring spot virus. And they get staining really? in specific places, the storage organs and the upper and lower gastric cica. Huh. Okay. Huh. They don't see any pathology. And it's the only tissues they see it. Curiously, they don't do any PCR on this mite, at least yeah. they don't show it. I thought that was weird. Or any in situ hybridization of bees. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So wait a minute, a, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, there's a real apples and oranges thing going on here where you, you see all this PCR going on and then suddenly you see this in situ hybridization. And I, I fully understand why they didn't want to dissect varroa mites because right. they're tiny. Yes. Um, it's probably not even possible. But well, it's possible. If you're gonna if you're gonna make an argument, and they do about well, it's only in the gut of the varroa mite, but it's systemic in the bee, so maybe the varroa mite is vectoring it. You need to have equivalent data to compare in order to say oh. that it, that might even be going on. That would still be a, a leap of faith because you'd have to have a a colony that's free of this with exactly. varroa mites would, and have it, would, it, and then coax postulates and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, it would still be a stretch, but at least that's if you had, right. if we could see a slide of a bee with the in situ and, and or yeah, exactly. some PCR from exactly. these mites, exactly. um, it might be a little more reassuring. Right. Uh, next, they look at uh, 10 different colonies. Well, they, so they have looked at 10 colonies, and they kind of classify them according to whether they're strong or weak. 
So a strong colony doesn't have collapse and, and a weak colony does. And I think they say that uh, the the, the uh, strong ones survive the winter and the weak, right. they die before February. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. Right. So they look at the incidence of various uh, viruses, including TRSV. They say both TRSV and Israeli acute paralysis virus were absent in bees from strong colonies in any given month, but both found in bees from weak colonies. Other viruses as well. Other viruses. So I, you know, mm. I really think that uh, these are all basically opportunistic infections. Yeah. I think here, these here, bees are here, sick. Here, here, here. That's right. And, uh, that's, that's and right. so they, you know, the viruses and other organisms take advantage that of that. Right. I mean, I got no proof for that, but there's no, there's no smoking gun for any one of these viruses. And yeah. it's, right. it's really smelling more like some right. sort of, to me, like some sort of other environmental problem well, like that pesticides. is uh, uh, hassling these bees and well, uh, makes them um, susceptible to opportunistic infections. Well, I, yes. think, I think some pesticides have actually been implicated here. Yeah. They have been implicated, yes. I, I actually had a conversation with an entomologist friend of mine recently, and I mentioned this uh, bit about the uh, new systemic pesticides uh, that have been implicated. And yeah. he was, he, was eh, he said, Skeptical. yeah, maybe, but, you know, we yeah. used to use DDT all over the place, and that <laughs> never bothered the bees any so maybe the systemic pesticides are different i don't know but in fact in a way that experiment's being done because in several european countries they've banned the systemic uh, pesticides and it'll be interesting to see whether that actually ultimately has any effect on colony collapse right yeah right what i was fascinated with was to learn how much a, a, a colony of bees actually is worth it's like fifty thousand dollars a colony it's huge. Yeah, I mean, you know what they a, say in the in the introduction here: the worth of, of uh, the worth of bees to honeybee pollination is valued at fourteen point six billion dollars exactly. in the U.S. annually. Exactly forty percent. Wow! Of all the produce on your table comes. Well, from some episodes ago, I picked that uh, video that uh, basically was a video put together by people who are slamming the uh, systemic pesticides uh, thing. Huh. And although it's sort of slanted towards that, it was nevertheless a very informative video on the on the whole uh, bee and pollina- uh, pollination industry. And it was fascinating the way they right. truck all these bees yep. all over the place right. Right. to uh, pollinate crops and yeah, all yeah. the problems involved in that. Huh. So Dixon, your initial question about pollen, so they you know yeah. they dissect the bees yeah, and they yeah, get the sequence yeah, from yeah, there. Yeah. So it's probably not from the pollen. Um, but uh, so the last experiment is they simply compare the sequence of these isolates from all the known TRSVs from plants, and they show that these are kind of a separate cluster. But I mean, they don't look at the TRVs TRSVs from the plants in their area where these bees are. I think right. that would be important. Did they look do. in yeah. the honey? No, I didn't look in the honey. No, that's actually what bees eat. So, what would you, you tell tell us why you would look in the honey? Well, maybe they acquire the virus inadvertently by just eating the honey, because that's their food source. So, I think I would like to know if there is TRSV in the environment of these bees. Right, and that's number <laughs> yes. one, of course. And which they haven't shown, so there's no linkage at all to that. Right. Um, I don't think that this is. Has deserves the attention that it's uh, yeah. obtained. You know, most of the stories have said a virus that has jumped from plants to bees. I don't think there's any proof of yeah, that. Yeah, I would. I totally. Here, what do you guys think? Uh, I think that uh, it's worth following up. Yep. But I, I don't think uh, I don't think it's nailed down. I think all of the stuff that you say about uh, holes in the experiments to prove replication are are valid. Uh, I'm a Somewhat disturbed by the fact that they don't have a uh, whole virus out or even whole virus sequence out the other end. So we don't wow. really know what this looks like. We just uh, uh, have some pieces. And I'm not buying at all the notion that this uh, is, I don't think these implicated in any way in colony collapse. Right. There right. may be some sort. Right. And, right. you know, I'm a little surprised. I, I don't know enough about this to know. Uh, whether they've done anything quite different. But they're finding this in 20% of the colonies that they looked at. Is that right? And uh, so I'm a little, su- it's pretty frequent in their hands. I'm a little surprised it hadn't been seen before. Huh. Uh, and I don't think that they are taking uh, an approach to this that is uh, in any way would enrich for 
uh, finding this particular agent. So that's a little funny as well. So more needs to be done, but, um, uh, you know, it's interesting, but I agree. It's not worth, uh, it's, it just amazes me how <laughs> if you hype your stuff, how much attention you can get. If you there was the, a there was a very well written press release that accompanied this. So is that um, I wanted to ask you, Alan, why this got so much conclusive well, it's, press? Well, this is this is kind of a um, it, it's a great clickbait clickbait recipe. It's um, it's about bees. People are interested in that. There's been a lot of news about that. So mm-hmm. you've you've got a topic that's reasonably hot, and then you have a story that um, that is counterintuitive. Um, this idea of a plant virus jumping into bees. So you, you kind of, I mean, you almost want that to be true because it would be mm. so so freakish for it to happen. Um, and, uh, and it's fairly easy to explain what their argument is. Unfortunately, when you dig into the data, I mean, what I see here is a, is a collection of results that are interesting and tantalizing, but right. they're not really done yet. Yeah, I mean, this isn't. It, it, this doesn't strike me as a set of data that should have been a paper. It strikes me as a set of data that should have been um, pursued further, and you know, developed better, better controls and at least better comparisons um, in, in order to turn it into a paper. And I, and I don't yeah. think they're that far from being able to have some kind of a paper out of this. I mean, yeah, it would be great if they could get live virus out of these bees and so forth, but even just fixing a few of the really glaring things like the negative controls and the, the lack, of insect, hybridization. Yeah. lack of insect sure. hybridization sure. on the sure. bees sure. and it, just a few things like that that I, I would think a reviewer should have asked for um, – would have made this a significantly stronger paper and maybe toned down a little bit of the discussion and certainly um, go a little easier in, in press descriptions of it, I guess. <laughs> so I, it could be that the bees simply acquire this virus when they feed, right? And yeah, it's in them. It's in them. It doesn't mean it's replicating. So that's Correct. the key. Show it's replicating, and, and I don't think they have. And yeah. then if you, even if you show it's replicating, you have to show that it has some detrimental effect on the bee, which you know, as part of their thesis. It would have been great if they could have infected some bees with this thing. Yeah, yes. I'd like to see that. You know, even if there's no yeah. culture system for it. Um, you could say they've got some isolate that they have the virus in. You take a take a, uh, a negative bee and stick some in it somehow. Yeah, see if yeah. It yeah you, take, you take a colony that tests consistently negative and go right. and, and inject a bunch of bees. Um, exactly. So, Alan, no... No article I read in the Times or any of the science publications, none of them was critical. I know, and it's weird. So I, is I, that I because the one, they didn't look at it or they couldn't? I, I don't know what happened there. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I mean, stuff like this happens sometimes. And, uh, you know, the Times, they didn't, it, they didn't exactly do a massive write-up on it. It's right. a, it's a really short. It was pretty short, yeah. Well, they don't have an... <clears throat> Uh, a resident virologist at the Times to review all of this. Well, no, and they can't afford <laughs> one either. But um, but they could have asked a however, virologist. However, Dixon, it would have been it would have been good if they'd taken they the time to maybe call exactly. around to some people who weren't exactly. on this paper, um, exactly. just to see. Sure. You know, does this look good to you? Yeah. The problem is they would have gotten a collection of uh, of opinions, mostly from people who haven't read it. And they would say, yeah. "Yeah, that's cool. It sounds great." Um, that's why I think TWIV is important because we can be critical and it's our field, right? So yeah. um, I hope that – so the, all the people who thought this was exciting, it's potentially exciting, but I don't think you should get too excited. Yeah, and I don't want to – I don't want to – Especially if it's the first plant virus to jump into the animal kingdom. It's not If that's probably. true – probably not. Right, probably not, but you don't, you don't know any other examples I yet. do. I have another paper. Oh, oh, oh. See, We're getting there, Dixon. You see, I, I am the perfect foil for this show you for are. many reasons. <laughs> and this is only one of many. No, but I think, I mean, I do think this is not such an unusual thing. I'm sure we didn't, we haven't detected it all that often, but I, I'm sure there are kingdom jumps that happen. Well, 
one of the interesting things that's going to come up uh, in this next paper is that there are <laughs> families of viruses that have very distinct characteristics like rhabdovirus as, and real viruses that show up in more than one kingdom. Right. Yeah. Okay. So uh, at some point in evolution, uh, the, the, the simplest explanation for that is that at some point in a, uh, evolution, there has been a jump from, oh, I suppose it could go back to the divergence of the kingdoms, but... Yeah. Huh. Yeah, if you go back far enough, you get, you're get you probably getting jumps way back there. Absolutely. So that's a really good point. There are viruses in different kingdoms, right? So where did it... It had to begin in one of them and go to the other. We just, you know, it's happened a long time ago and we haven't seen it. Yeah. This reminded me of a, of a paper that is from 1999... And the comment uh, from one of our listeners who said, is there any evidence of a virus jumping from plant to animal? That's exactly what this paper suggests. It's from PNAS, from Gibbs and Weiler. Just before we move on, yes, I just sir. want to um, say, you know, we've kind of shredded this uh, this B paper. Um, and it's not that the researchers are bad at this. I think they put in a lot of work here. It's just that somebody needed to step in and say, to finish the job. Right, right. So uh, one thing about MBIO is they don't like to ask for additional experiments. If you get to That's the point of, yeah, if you get to the point of being reviewed, they say it's either going to be yes or no. We're not uh, going to ask you to do more experiments. And I think uh, that's unfortunate because a few more, as Alan said, would have really helped here. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And we don't I don't mean to trash it. I'm just pointing out the weaknesses. I do I mean I think it would be great if this thing jumped, but um, we're not there yeah, yet. Yeah, and hopefully we'll story. hear more. Yeah. Right. So the, the PNS paper from, two, from 1999 is called Evidence that a plant virus switched hosts to infect a vertebrate and then recombined with a vertebrate infecting virus. This is a long time ago, 1999. It's before, yeah. you, before you were born, Dixon. A <laughs> long, and, long time ago. And it's all based on sequencing. This is a bioinformatics um, paper here, and there weren't a lot of sequences back then. In fact, I don't think there are many more of these particular viruses now. And yeah. I noticed reading the paper that the bioinformatics was uh, infant enough so that they take great pains to go through all the bioinformatic manipulations yeah. uh, that they did, whereas now it would just be a sentence saying, I used this program, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it is unusual in that sense. So this concerns uh, two families of viruses, that uh, one of which we've talked about, the circoviruses, uh -huh. small DNA viruses with single-stranded circular DNA genomes. You like the ones that killed all those pigs? I don't know if they killed all the pigs, Dixon. Remember the pigs that in were the floating? Shanghai it's, River? It's exactly. circumstantial evidence. Exactly. <laughs> <What's> the, <laughs> wait a minute, we missed Alan's joke. What's that? Uh, circumstantial yeah. evidence circumstantial. for that. Circumstantial. Um, circoviruses are in all of us. Okay. They infect over 90% right. of the population. Our blood supply is full of them. Uh, porcine circoviruses cause disease in pigs. And in fact, the, uh, if you remember, the rotavirus vaccine a few years ago was found to contain porcine circovirus. <laughs> uh, did you say small, single-stranded circular DNA? Yeah, I did. did and you <laughs> said naked capsid? I didn't say naked capsid. This and by, is, it is naked capsid. It is naked, yeah. And and by small, we're talking two kilobases, which is like tiny. Really tiny. Two yeah. genes, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, so those are circos. And then we have nanoviruses, which are plant viruses. And very similar, uh, icosahedral capsid, single-stranded circular DNA genome. Also small, as the name in blows. Yeah. <laughs> These are among the smallest particles, 17 to 22 nanometers. And they both encode a capsid protein to make that lovely T equals one capsid. <laughs> 60 subunits of one protein. I just think that's so cool. That you could build a particle with one protein repeated 60 times. Yeah. Does anyone else think that's cool? I do. Uh, I do. Yeah. Sure. Okay. But the nanoviruses, yes. what makes them particularly weird and different from the circoviruses is that they uh, are a multipartite genome. Yes. So they have a bunch of different genes that show up on different circles, all packaged separately. Right. Okay? Yeah. Which is supremely weird. So <laughs> this would be like 10-hit kinetics or something like that. Holy cow. Right. 
All right, so plants, so nanoviruses are plant viruses, and circos are animal. And they, as I said, they have a capsule protein, and they have another protein called a replication initiator protein, or REP. And this is sort of, would it be fair, Rich, to say it's like an origin binding protein? Yeah, and I helps, think so. Helps initiate DNA replication. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these viruses get in the nucleus, and they have to get the DNA polymerase of the host cell t to replicate them because they don't encode their own. Uh, and so they're initially transcribed to produce an mRNA, makes this rep protein, and then that kind of tricks the host uh, polymerase to replicating the genome. This is pretty typical. I say I think the sort of uh, every virus has to have some sort of replication protein, and the sort of the the minimal replication uh, protein, if you're going to rely on the host for everything else, is something that specifically recognizes the viral DNA and then recruits all of the cellular machinery to that molecule. It says, hey, look, do this one now. Yeah. So the, the heart of this uh, paper, there are actually two parts. And the one part is an analysis of, this rep, of these rep genes in the circo and the nanoviruses, and they're very similar. They're arranged in a very similar way. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the origin of replication of the DNA is very close to the rep gene in both cases. So they look at all the available sequences of, of the circovirus and nanovirus rep, and they basically make the conclusion that uh, the first, um, the, the, nano, the, the circoviruses were once nanoviruses in plants. They have a common plant ancestor. And at some point, uh, this plant virus got into animals and established the circovirus lineage. All right, so this is based on a sequence analysis of this rep protein. Yeah. So, you know, they hypothesized that, you know, maybe an animal was licking sap off of a tree and it had a nanovirus in it and it established uh, an infection, something like that, right? So this is a plant-to-animal uh, transfer. Maybe it was a bee. <laughs> it could have been a bee. Maybe. So, do any animals eat bees, Dixon? Oh, yeah. Who? Bears? Yeah, I was thinking of bears, yeah. I had a dog who ate bees. He was really a strange dog. <laughs> <laughs> I had a dog who ate bees. I like that as a title, actually. <laughs> um, all right, so, from plant to animal. There you go. Now, there's much less... It's hard to put... <laughs> This is only sequence-based. There's no experiment. There's no wet experiment as we had in the other paper right. where you can look for the, the presence of the plant virus in the bee or a plant virus in an animal. So this is inferred by the, by the sequence. And as far as I can tell, it's pretty good evidence, right? Does anyone have any criticisms of the bioinformatics? Uh, 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 not from what I can see. <laughs> I, I'm humana, not humana, qualified humana, humana. to have I, yeah, exactly. criticisms of really, bioinformatics. Exactly. I mean, it looks of of bioinformatic papers I've I've read. This seems to be in line with fairly yeah. standard practices. That's about all I can say. Actually, if you look at these uh, alignments, yeah, uh, where they're highlighting the identities among these proteins. Uh, in particular, when they're talking about the possibility that there was this recombination event that um, crafted this uh, new virus, it's it's pretty convincing. Just yeah, not calling it. yeah, exactly. yeah. The alignments make sense. Yeah. So the second part of this paper is that the rep protein, um, the I think it's the C terminal part of the rep protein, is highly similar. It's very similar to a RNA binding protein from the viruses I work on, the coronaviruses, called 2C. And they say that probably what happened, this nanovirus got in an animal and established itself. And at some point, it recombined with uh, a picornavirus 2C gene and acquired that because they say it's quite clear that it's, it's picornaviral. It's got lots of the features. 2C is a picorna protein involved in uh, RNA replication. It's an RNA binding protein. And it uh, seems to be in these uh, circle viruses. So plant to animal, and then the animal was infected with a picorna-like virus and recombined uh, one of the genes into the circle virus, and that yeah, gave us... And you can kind of spin a story around that. You know, the animal <clears throat> eats some part of the plant. It, uh, the virus gets into the animal gut where there's a picorna virus because that's not uncommon. Yeah. Uh, somehow they, they get together. There's a recombination event in a single cell, and... Um, this happens. Right. Now, so it's, it's plausible. The circovirus is a DNA virus, and the picornas are RNA viruses, okay? And 
you know, we our cells do have reverse transcriptases in them. So that's not un- unlikely that the, the coronary was reverse transcribed to DNA and then this DNA recombined with the circo. And they say we, this is more likely to have happened in animals because they don't know whether the recombination occurred in before or after the transfer to animals because plant viruses have reverse transcriptase too, the colimo viruses that we talked yeah. about a few weeks ago. But they say it's kind of rare compared to animal cells. So, And, and animals eating plants is more common than plants eating animals, although the reverse does, does occur. It does. Can you give us an example? Pitcher plant. Pitcher? Pitcher. Venus flytrap. Venus nice. flytrap. Sundew. Yeah. Wow, I think we should work on the viruses of those. There's a bunch yes, of them. Cool. So um, there you go. There's a cool paper with some evidence that it went, viruses can go from uh, plants to animals. Right. Uh, there's. I'm looking back because I remembered one of these papers had this nice discussion, and it turns out to be the B paper. Yeah. Uh, where they summarize uh, these sort of uh, kingdom switching viruses. Oh, right. Yes. Uh, Rhabdoviridae, uh, arboviruses. Uh, that is, they're carried by ar- uh, arthropods, and they have broad range of hosts in animal and plant kingdoms. Flockhouse virus is a positive strand RNA virus. Uh, Notoviridae, we've done this before, yeah, yep. replicates in plants as well as yeast and mammalian cells. Uh, and then uh, tomato spotted wilt virus, which is a bunya virus, um, could alter the behavior of uh, its uh, arthropod vectors. So um, uh, it's not as if this is totally unusual. Uh, kingdom switching viruses, right? Interesting. Yeah, because because I, well, I'm better informed than I was. Put it that way. <laughs> yeah, this is not this is um, this is not a ridiculous idea. No, no, and uh, it's not so unusual, probably. So, I guess you just have to temper your enthusiasm. Yeah, and we just, I mean, somebody needs to find some good, solid evidence of it uh, yeah, going yeah. on. What do you think, Dixon? you like that paper? I do. You like those papers? I like both of them. Okay. How do you like hearing papers de novo? Wonderful, because then I get to ask really uh, listener questions yeah, rather than but virus questions. It makes you listen, right? Of course. As it's presented. That's true. Well, I don't get all the details, obviously, because we're giving executive summaries of all this. Well, yes, of course. But you don't fall asleep, do you? Of course not. Uh, shall we do some email? <laughs> I can. Conf- I, I mean, that doesn't that put me to sleep, but other things might. Rich, Rich you're confessing you went to I'm, sleep. Yeah, I'm confessing. No, I'm not confessing that. I'm confessing that I attend most journal clubs, having not read the paper yeah. in advance of the yeah. journal club. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, it's actually interesting practice in learning how to assimilate and think on the fly. Here, here. So, yeah. No pun intended, okay. of course. Yeah, I, love no it. Pun intended. I love it. Right. All right. Let me take uh, the first two here. Uh, emails. First is uh, is from Robin, who gives a weather report for Kathy. Because I guess last time she was having trouble getting her her app. So he has a pre made link to Ann Arbor, Michigan, where it currently is minus ten degrees Celsius, Burr. and with clouds breaking up. There you go. Thank you, Robin. Uh, Henry writes, "Hello, just a short comment." I was reading your blog and noticed you wanted to do some sort of poll about viruses are alive. You said you had problems with SurveyMonkey dumping your data. I want to make a suggestion. And he said, just get a WordPress plugin, which I did, and it works. Uh huh. Cool. So back that poll is back up. Thank you, Henry. And then he says, P.S. I am not involved in the medical profession, but I did find your video of the BSL-4 laboratory very interesting. Oh. I'm surprised that they built this facility in Boston. Yes, they have a lot of security. But anything developed by man can be damaged by other men if they are determined to do so. E.g., I think such a facility could be a terrorist target. I would hate for them to have wasted all that money building such a facility, but I would understand why people would not feel safe to let it operate where it is located. (laughs) Indeed, that's why it's still not open. It's going to be hard to move it. Well, you know, I I had the same sort of reaction when I first started to consider this, but then there's... It's not uncommon to build these BSL-4 cities in, in uh, uh, populated areas. Uh, case in point, the CDC's facility in Atlanta. Right. Okay. So there's a, there's right. a history of this. Right. right. Uh, Alan. Uh, so this, um, let's see, we're up to Jacob, right? Yep. 
Jacob and Stephen on yeah. both of these. They both sent. Uh, uh, Jacob says something. Something tells me this might interest you. Um, and Stephen also sent the link. This is um, mm -hmm. part of a site of a, a web comic that I've pointed to a few times called XKCD. Uh, and the the artist who does that also runs this site called What If, um, where he mm -hmm. answers hypothetical questions. And this one is, what if every virus in the world were collected into one area? How much volume would they take up and what would they look like? And there's this very nice walkthrough of, um, of how much, uh, you know, the hum if all the human viruses in all the humans in the world were brought together, they'd fill about 10 oil drums. Um, and then uh, you get up, if you really collected all the viruses, you'd have a, um, uh, a pile the size of a small mountain. Um, but uh, then he, uh, it's hard, hard to, to say exactly what the virus mountain would look like, but it would probably resemble something in between pus and meat slurry. <laughs> <laughs> Yum. Regardless of its exact appearance, it would almost certainly be disgusting. <laughs> so there's your visual. He says it would fill the Super Bowl site, yes. MetLife Stadium, 150 <laughs> times over. I like so that one. Watch the Super Bowl. <laughs> take a moment to picture all the players floating suspended in a sea of yellowish-white secretions. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, guys. Very good. Rich Condit. Uh, You've got uh, Dr. Kelly here. Dr. Kelly writes, Dear Twiv Docs, I was listening to the radio on my way home from the beach this afternoon, mm. and I heard in the last week deaths from flu had doubled to a total of 95 or 96. The total deaths for 2013 were 106, so it looks like this flu season will be much worse than last year's. They didn't provide any information on the percent of California residents vaccinated this season. My wife and I, both over 60 and my wife is immune suppressed, have received two doses. I haven't seen any information about which strains are causing most of the deaths. Do you folks have any information about this? I'm also thinking that if this keeps up, we could be in for a big West Nile season as well. Mm. With occasional rains followed by warm to hot weather, it seems like ideal conditions for this to occur. I concur. My wife receives two infusions of intravenous gamma globulin a week to treat a rare autoimmune disease. She receives the infusions at a local hospital's cancer center day hospital where patients receive chemo, blood, etc. On Monday, when we were taken to the IGIV infusion suite, uh, a patient with a cough, fever, and runny nose was already in the room. When we asked to have my wife's infusion uh, in another room, the nurse told us that the other patient's patient wasn't infectious and besides she was all the way across the room we insisted and after talking with the unit supervisor my wife was moved to a chemo room for the day i guess i shouldn't be surprised about this situation because on any day we are there there are between two or three nurses with masks on because they refuse to be vaccinated it's easy to see why the general public may not take the need for getting the flu vaccine seriously when health professionals who treat and care for immune suppressed patients don't either sorry about my rant but i know the value of vaccination both from a professional and a personal perspective the weather here in orange county california in orange <laughs> california uh, has been in the mid 70s to mid 80s for the past 35 days with humidities in the teens to single digits I'm glad I was able to get a few days in on snow in late November. The surf has been good, and this past week <laughs> has been large, 8 to 10 feet at our local beaches. Mavericks in Northern California is breaking, and the big surf invitational contest was supposed to take place today. Surf of 30 to 40 feet. Lord. With occasional sets over 45 Lord. feet. Expected to clean, uh, expected to uh, expected with clean faces under clear skies. We like the good surf and warm days, but really need some rain. True. If you know of anyone who can do a good rain dance, send them our way. <laughs> we just got some yesterday, so maybe. How about you, Dixon? Can you do a good rain dance? Not really. No. Well, I can tell Vincent, you what happens if you don't get rain, though. <laughs> Vincent has the uh, uh, CDC uh, website on flu here, and I want to hear his. Uh, take on this whole thing. So the peak of influenza appeared to be uh, towards the end of 2013. It seems to be going down now. The predominant strain this year is the 2009 H1N1 
virus. That's the one we got. Which, uh, well, the vaccine has that in the H3N2. The H3N2 has been around. Uh, that last year it predominated, but this year it's H1N1. It's interesting because when the H1N1 showed up, it dominated everything and sort of pushed the others aside. Then the others made a comeback, and yeah. this year it's uh, the H1N1 again. Yeah, Interesting. it's weird. It's going back and forth. I guess it depends on who's immune in the population and so forth. Uh, in terms of mortality, so there are two ways that you can look at this. There is uh, pneumonia and influenza mortality surveillance, which is an estimate because uh, in adults, you, you usually don't mark a death certificate with influenza as the cause of death. It's usually pneumonia. So uh, it's an estimate. So there's always an <laughs> epidemic threshold. And last year, we exceeded it substantially. Yeah. And this year, we have a peak that looks like it's not going to be as high. So it's slightly less. That's all cities in the U.S., 122 cities. Now, pediatric deaths, there up to age of 18. You can put flu on the... You have to put flu on the death certificate if that's uh, one of the things that's involved. Last year, there were 171 pediatric uh, deaths last season and this season so far, 40. So it may not be as serious as last year. California is one of 12 uh, or 10 or 12 um, states with, with a lot of influenza-like illness. So it's one of the most severe as compared to a, a few others. So it's H1N1 and... Um, it's not surprising that California, which is where you are, is uh, is doing that, uh, Robert. But it doesn't seem to be any worse this year than no. in many previous years, which is interesting. There's been uh, some buzz in our local paper as well because we've had uh, what anecdotally would appear to be an excess of flu mortalities in our local area uh, this year. Um, but um, I guess it's really, on average, no worse than ever. Well, it did, I mean, if you look at the pneumonia mortality curve, um, it did spike at the end of 2013, well above the epidemic threshold. Mm -hmm. Um, But it's not as high as uh, end of 2012. So last year it was worse, and assuming it doesn't go any higher this year, it's a little bit better, but compared to previous years, it's it's still pretty high. Yeah. What most people people, uh, don't recognize or you don't think about is that flu typically kills 30,000 people a year in this country. It's, you know, it's a, it's a pretty big deal on a, yep. on a good year. I don't uh, know how this nurse knew that the person was not infectious. I think that's, uh, yeah, well, I'm not buying that. That's one. The other thing I'm yeah. really um, upset about is to learn that there are healthcare workers that are supposedly well-educated and they believe in the infection uh, mantra that yeah. the disease is created by organisms that enter your body, and they refuse to get it vaccinated. It's unbelievable. How can this you is, allow this that? A, yeah, this is a common and major problem at hospitals and clinics. That's um, incredible. And it's, and it's an ongoing topic of discussion in the, um, the flu control and, and vaccine community. How do you reach these people? Because you've got somebody who's, you know, an educated professional, a, a, a nurse, or sometimes even a doctor who right. just says, oh, no, I don't need the flu shot. And they, they come up with various excuses, things like, well, I'm healthy. Um, sure. You know, they, that sort of thing. I never get these things. Um, but that just flies in the face of the evidence. And if you're treating exactly. sick patients, you know, you should at least look out for your patients. Yeah. yeah, that's very true. By the way, Mavericks is the name of my operating system. Yes. It's uh-huh. named after that beach. I'll be is darned. it? Yeah. I'll be darned. Yeah, Apple is, is honoring for the next few uh, OSs the great surfing beaches. Ha, I okay. Gotta, I got to look and see where that beach is. <laughs> In fact, my picture on my desktop is Bloody Mavericks. Not Bloody, it's Mavericks. <laughs> it's not Bloody. <laughs> Dixon. Which, yes. You are sick. Can you read a long email? I'll this try. Is I'll, long. Give it, I'll give it my best. Is he contagious? Um, Probably. Sure. He <laughs> just should not have come in today. That's not true at all. Yeah. I'm tough. I'm from Jersey. No, because of me. I don't want you to infect oh, you. me or someone else. You know how diseases are transmitted. Now, come on. I haven't given Coughs you... By the, way, by the way, I just have to say that flu site, the CDC flu site is terrific. It is. It's great. I really yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Yeah. Flu view. All right, Dixon. Dear Twiv Superstars. Who's the name of the person? Right. Uh, Basil. Okay. Thank you, Dixon. Right. Dear Twiv Superstars, <laughs> I'm very pleased to find that my lovely podcast, that is Twiv, 
has discussed and featured the work on using Reese's cytomegalovirus CMV-based vectors for SIV-HIV vaccine. This is particularly of great interest to me because following the completion of my PhD in rhesus cytomegalovirus, my veterinary anatomic pathology at New England Primate Research Center with extensive training on SIV-associated pathologies, and finally a year of fellowship, <laughs> the FDA's Office of Cellular Tissue and Gene Therapies, I relocated two months ago to Georgia, to, I'm sorry, to Oregon National Primate Research Center as an investigative pathologist to work on the same project of RHCMV-based vector vaccines for SIV and HIV infections. I don't think I could have planned this if I wanted to. I would certainly second the previous request, first requested on episode 267 for featuring a TWIV episode on CMV. TWIV has repeatedly discussed CMV, but always as a bystander, such as Dr. Schenk's talk on metabolomics. Dr. Coyne's talk on viral resistance conferred by trophoblasts, and lastly, the CMV-based vaccine for HIV. CMV is also the leading cause of congenital viral infection in the U.S. and leads with major birth defects. CMV li- lives with most of us as prevalence reaches up to 90% of population in the U.S. Despite the extensive research, Despite the expensive research that is done on CMV for many uh, past decades, no vaccine is available against this viral infection. One of the main reasons is that CMV is species-specific and hence you can't easily study HCMV in lab animals. That is in addition to the fact that CMV carries the largest genome of herpes, herpes viruses with very complex sets of genes that play major roles in modulating the host termed non-essential genes, rather than performing basic replication machinery, termed essential genes. Finally, CMV recrudescence is of major uh, concern in transplantation due to the associated immunosuppression. I hope by this I stimulated your interest in CMV, and I look forward to joy to the joy of listening to a CMV t- TWIV episode. Weather-wise, and being new to Oregon and its weather, I got to learn a new weather term. Word of the day is frozen fog. We get that here. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, fog droplets don't freeze due to lack of nuclei and get super cooled. Once droplets contact an object below freezing, they turn to ice, a.k.a. frozen fog. On that note, weather here is 42F, 6C, with 10% precip- precipitation, 76% humidity, and 10 mile per hour winds. And I miss the sun. <laughs> Finally, my pick of the week. Shall I read this? Yeah. As a pathologist, I came across this channel on YouTube, and I find it to be a wonderful effort by a pathologist to share knowledge and for free across the globe. Dr. Minarik has done a wonderful a favor to everyone interested in pathology worldwide to learn this science from the best. He not only provides abstract lectures, he has videos that correlated clinical findings to autopsy findings to microscopic findings and connect them all in one place. You will learn pathology the way it should be taught in an integrated fashion. I hope you find this contribution useful. The YouTube channel, which has all the videos, is here that he lists that. An official website for the course is here. And cool, he that. that's neat. Thank you, Dr. Racaniello and the TWIV team for this wonderful effort. We are all indebted to you. Sincerely yours, Basil. Hey, we are superstars. Or basil. Well, that's, that nice? you know, I... I like that. <laughs> okay. All right. Are you exhausted now, Dixon? No, I'm invigorated by the All fact right. that you asked me to do something. <laughs> <laughs> well, listen to the next one, okay? Because I think this is, has to do with you. It's from Jeff, who Uh-oh. writes... Uh-oh. Hello, on the last episode, I think I heard one of you say that ticks can pass Borrelia between generations transoverally. Ovarially. Yeah. I am way out of my expertise here, but I had thought that ticks were unable to pass Borrelia to their offspring and that the nymphs were only infected after feeding on mice and other rodentia, so that it is really a mouse bacteria. Was I completely wrong? No, he's right. It's not passed ovarily, transoverally. Did, it, did you say that? I don't think I did. I thought you had. I don't remember saying okay. that. Okay. Let's right. go to the videotape. Oh, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm really not enjoying this. <laughs> okay, so I got norovirus wrong, but Jesus, how could I get Borrelia wrong also? Also, Vince, you mentioned that humans could vanish and there would be no effects on wild organisms. I think uh, I have the spirit of your point. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, you got it. 
I immediately think of deer populations, which rely on humans to keep them in check. No other large predator that I am aware of, at least here in Georgia, and coyotes, which to my understanding usually live very close to humans. I would think that if humans vanished, the deer population would explode. That would affect the populations of vegetation they eat, and the coyotes might have a rough time of it. Anyway, great episode. Thanks for making us think. If humans disappeared, though... The wolves would come right back. Exactly, we would stop... Because killing off the predators. The, before the humans were in Georgia, the Gotta deer either. had large predators eating them, and yeah, all that yeah. happened was that the humans chased out the the mountain lions that's and right. the wolves that's and right. the other that's large right. predators that used yeah. to kill the deer. Thank and you, that's Alan. why Thank that's you, why Alan. it's our job to replace them and with a car. <laughs> well, I think that, so now we have cars. That's right. That's so right. the point is that there would be changes, but they would probably be back to what things used to be before. Correct. Us, right? Yes, there would be changes. Uh, there, there might actually be, um, probably would be a short-term explosion in the population of deer, but I think the wolves would come back fairly quickly. Yeah. 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 The claim um, is that there were less than a million deer here when Columbus first landed, and now there are over 10 million. All right, Alan, you are next. Okay. Uh, let's see. Robert writes, Hi, Doctors Twiv. Uh, this is a follow-up to Twiv 266. It's more or less current in that the lead paper in that episode appeared in Nature this week, depletion of CD4 cells during HIV infection by pyroptosis. But what I wanted to point out was another article in the same issue, rare coding variants in the phospholipase D3 gene confer risk for Alzheimer's disease. I have greatly enjoyed Twiv and the virology lectures. I have learned a great deal from you all, but especially Dr. Racaniello. On the other hand, I think you might want to read the Alzheimer's article to better appreciate the arguments in human heritability. While many of the concepts are the same, your discussion of viri seems much deeper and more intimate. Not to complain, I really am a devoted fan of TWIV, etc. <laughs> Honestly, I, I, I don't understand. I mean, I, read the, I looked at the paper and I, I don't understand what... Did we make a mistake in, the, in that? I don't know. I'm not sure, Bob... Uh, we should hire a virus checker, a virus fact checker. Um, maybe we don't understand human heritability. Perhaps. Yeah, if we if we screwed something up in the genetics, um, go ahead and let us know. I, I'm not sure what. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, there are there are coding variants that affect Alzheimer's disease risk. That's not that's not an entirely new concept. Um, and I think this was just another paper that did a particularly good job of yeah. of exploring that. Anyway, thank you, Bob. Uh, yeah. Rich Condit, you are next. Russell writes, Dear Twiv team, I'm a graduate student. I'm a grad student at the University of Utah, and I saw this infographic on Reddit and thought I'd pass it along as a listener pick of the week. Uh, and he's uh, picked a site here that uh, mm. graphically illustrates uh, graft and corruption <laughs> during the uh, creation of the Olympic uh uh, games site in see, Russia. Yeah, see. Um, see how, how unpredictable. Uh, uh, Alexei Navalny created the graphic to show the insane amounts of overspending and cost overrun to create many of the Olympic uh, venues. <laughs> what I like best about it is the amounts over budget are put into perspective. For example, the cost to build the media center is equivalent to buying every high school uh, grad in Russia a MacBook. I wonder how many vertical farms that would be, or Russian R01 equivalents. It's a great way to spend a few minutes or hours. Wow. It's 31 Fahrenheit minus 1C here in Salt Lake City. So, yeah, we often complain about misallocation of uh, funds, and this is a nice graphic example of, well, how money is being, how much money is being spent in the Olympics? Yeah, it's a yeah. lot. Yeah. It's a yeah. lot. You know. This is the way the world runs, right? It's the way the world runs, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Yeah. Right. It is nice to bring mm -hmm. people together for the Olympics. Oh, yeah. That yes. aspect of it oh, I yeah. like. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can't just can the media center and give me my R01, you know, right. <laughs> or uh, give somebody else an R01. Although some, of, some of the athletics is pretty amazing, too. I would like to take 10% uh, of the defense budget in the U.S. and convert it to oh, R1. So, tell you about right? It. That's good. Oh, yeah. Tell you about oh, yeah. But that's not the way it works. Even 5%. Give me 5 <laughs> Hey, I'll take 1% of the farm bill they just passed. We'll start passed. negotiating down yet. I don't, I don't want it for myself. I want it for all the people out there. Gentlemen, yeah. we just passed a $1 trillion farm bill yesterday. Come yep. on. Now, is that important? 
Uh, if you're a farmer, it sure is. Yeah. Well, it's to, to the entire global economy, it's hugely important. <laughs> yeah. so, um, agriculture does a lot. Now let's do one more, Dixon. You're the sure. wrap-up here. Yegor writes, Dear Twivers, I recently got into podcasting. There are many excellent podcasts out there on many topics, but your show quickly made it to the top of the must-listen list. I see that you featured the Visual Science Studio as a pick of the week back in 2010, but it's worth bringing it up again. So he lists the uh, connection. It's a commercial science-focused art studio, but on the side, they make computer-rendered models of viruses using the latest scientific knowledge about their structures. They call this the Viral Park Project. 2010... I worked with them on a model of HIV, which I have to say is already outdated. <laughs> but since then, they've produced models of Ebola virus, papilloma virus. And just last week, they released a model of the influenza virus. Check it out. After I posted the flu virus image on my blog, I got an interesting comment from one of the readers. He said that models like this may in fact harm the relationship between science and society because they don't clearly identify which parts of the model are based on solid data and which parts are hypothetical or even artistic fantasy. It gives the impression that we know these viruses in minute details. So when people find errors in these models, that fuels the backlash against scientists and may even lead to such things as HIV denialism. What do you make of that? Love your show, Igor. Uh, First, th this site is gorgeous. Yeah, the pictures are think, beautiful. Yeah, they're they're beautiful, and I'm not, and I don't buy the criticism. Lighten up, okay? <laughs> these are really these are really pretty, and they're from what I can tell, uh, there's a, a lot of accuracy in them. Yeah, you know, I think anything that encourages people to look at viruses is good. I always, sure. I bring these virus plushy things to my class, and I say, here, the, here's what's wrong with these. But you know, if a kid gets one and and get, knows about a virus, I think that's good. I do the yeah, same thing. Absolutely. I like the EBV one with the eyelashes. <laughs> yes, that's very cute. <laughs> yeah. um, no, they're beautiful. They are beautiful. These Igor are are just gorgeous. I hadn't yeah, seen this really site. I love them. Yeah. Yeah, I am going to use some of these. You know, I mean, it's okay. It's a, it's an ongoing work in progress, right? Figuring right. out how yeah. viruses look. So, right. yeah, and, and I, the source of things like HIV denialism or or anti vaccine nuttery is not an error in an artist's interpretation of a model. It's a, that that comes from a totally different place. Yeah. Right. All right. Let us do a few picks of the week. And Dixon, get ready. Don't give me that look. Oh, come Lord. on, I know you can come up with something. <laughs> Let's start with Alan, please. What do you have? Uh, well, what I have is, um, sorry if this is a bit of a downer, but it's just, it's a, it's. I find this an amazing piece of film. This is footage um, that is from uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory. It's just oh. recently been made public. Um, and they shot this video... Um, at right near the end of World War II on an island in the South Pacific. Um, so it's shot mostly in color, shows some guys pulling a large bomb out of a hangar and preparing it and yes. loading it into an aircraft. And then you see um, uh, what that bomb is. Uh, this is annotated. Hmm. You can turn off the annotations. Um, but this is just unedited footage of, oh. of the original oh. preparation and delivery of the bomb that was dropped on Nagasaki. Yeah, it's really right. amazing. I watched it. It's very creepy. Yep. Yeah. It's amazing. It's it's chilling. It, yeah. it really is. I mean, you see, it starts off with just these, you know, military guys doing their ordinary daily job, and they're just preparing this thing and doing these, these duties, and, and you get to the point of the aerial footage, and it's pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, that's there. You go. That's science being used in a destructive being, way. Uh, right? Being applied, science does not make moral judgments. It just tells you what can be done. Dirk, huh? Dual use research of concern. Yes, <laughs> this was single use research. <laughs> yeah, that's single use. <laughs> yeah, it was meant for that purpose. Yeah. Yep. Rich Conde, what do you have? Uh, this is something I just stumbled across. Uh, I'm not crazy about the commercialism in this, but the film is pretty cool. It's the GoPro Red Bull status, the full story. <laughs> so this is a this is a YouTube video about I don't know eight minutes long of, of Felix Baumgartner's uh, jump out of a gondola 
oh, uh, yes. from 24 miles up, oh, where he yes. broke. They broke. This team broke about three different records, I think. Highest balloon uh, 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 launch, manned balloon launch, um, and the highest uh, uh, parachute jump. Uh, and he also broke, broke the, the speed speed record for uh, unaided human uh, speed through the atmosphere or whatever. Okay, right. so he he t- he broke the sound barrier, and at his peak speed, he was going almost 850 miles an hour. <laughs> wow. Cool. So he's and they got they got these uh, GoPro cameras all over him. So you get uh, several different uh, uh, perspectives on the fall, and it's really interesting because when he first of all, it's pretty creepy when he jumps out. You get the picture from the gondola. Yeah, um, it's interesting because in the beginning, you can see he's going like crazy, but his clothes aren't flapping. Right, because there's no Cause air. Because there's because no. there's no air. Exactly. And you can see his speed increase, and then as he hits the thicker atmosphere, his speed decreases. It's amazing, you and didn't also burn up. <laughs> in the uh, yeah. in the middle of this, uh, he goes into a spin, and he has to get himself out of it. So he nearly loses it, and you can see that on the video. So it's 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 pretty crazy. Wow. Why didn't he burn up? I don't know. He was going fast <laughs> enough. I think you got to start higher. Then you burn it, yeah, he's not. He's not high enough to have that. Problem. That's really cool. That's really cool. So, actually, I, I have a. <laughs> this is probably, you know, this is uh, a digression, but there must be only so far that a balloon can go up. Yep. True. Right. True. Because yes. after a while, you're just floating on the top of whatever atmosphere there this is, is very, left. Very, very exactly. Cool. You're limited by the buoyancy. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And you need rockets. Yeah. yeah. Dixon, did you think of something? No, no. I, I, I can tell you. One of the things that I've been thinking about. You guys is are it, all is laughing at me. Being, is, is it something else being dropped from you know, a height? No, <laughs> no, no, no. It's a it's a new way of getting light into a building without expending energy to do so. So one of the big criticisms of the whole uh, fabrication of a vertical farm, or of even trying to light a building without using electric lights, if you have. Let's say you live in the Middle East, for instance, where you have unlimited amounts of sunlight. You have 350 days a year, a year of sunlight. So how would you uh, accomplish that without expending energy? Windows? No, you can say that, but you, know, you, lose a lot of, <laughs> you lose a lot like that, by the way. So there's a guy that actually came up with a gigantic lens. All right? It looks like a, a lens that has been removed from your eye. And this lens concentrates light. And what he's using this for right now, although he will be using it for something else later, and I'll get the exact reference for this, I'll go back to my computer and look it up, is he concentrates light onto photovoltaic cells. And instead of just getting this diffuse light that comes onto the photovoltaic cell and gives you about 10 to 15% efficient conversion of sunlight to energy, he gets about an 80% conversion hmm. of sunlight to energy because he concentrates it right hmm. down. So you need much, much smaller photovoltaic cells. And if we're ever attacked by giant ants, we'll be all set. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> nice. Another dual use for... So what is this thing called? Well, it's... I'll get the name of it. It's it's a uh, it's a lens. It's obviously a light... Uh, I think light if we Google lens, lens we're going to get a lot of stuff out. No, yeah. no, I'll get it. I'll get it. Don't worry. I'll go back to my computer and get it because I, I ran across that. I was fascinated by it. So you could do the same thing with one of these devices on a rooftop mm-hmm. where they have something called a solar tube. And the solar tubes are very popular in Florida, by the way, Rich. Uh, you take this highly reflective inner surface of a tube, and the outer, uh, the outer tube itself ends on the roof, and it has a frizzel lens, like you would have on a lighthouse, and the lens concentrates the light into the into the solar tube, and it distributes it throughout the building, and you can bounce it off walls or off of you know furniture and stuff like this, and you can work in daylight in a building with no windows. Cool. Very nice. Cool. Done. Yeah. That's so, neat. so make sure you find it. Don't forget. I know going, you're forgetful. No, I, that's true. But I won't forget this one because I'm Dixon, you sound like you could really use some chicken soup or something. I, I did have some yeah. chicken soup for lunch. Actually, that's exactly what I did. I had some chicken soup. So I'm working on it. I'm working. Okay. On it. Uh, my pick is an educational tool, and it is something I started using this semester. I'm teaching my virology class here at Columbia. And uh, based on my Coursera experience, you know, there you can embed questions in the video. 
and get people to see if they're getting it. So uh, as many of you know, you can have clicker-based audience response uh, tools where you put up a question on the screen during your lecture and, and they push a button on their clicker and then the information all comes up. But there are now uh, tools that don't require clickers. You can just have a an iPhone, a smartphone, a, a tablet, or a laptop. You log into Socrative.com. And so you can go there and make a free teacher account and load in your questions. And then at the time of the uh, lecture, you tell the students to log into the student site. Huh. Huh. And you give them a, a room number. And my room number, of course, is virus and uh you push, you push it yeah but i didn't want a number and i found that you could actually put a word in and uh, you push them your question they all answer it and then in real time the answers pop up in a bar graph and That's you can very see cool. and you can see how they've done right all so i right. usually in my lectures are an hour and 15 minutes and i put four to five questions interspersed and i tell them these are the main points i want you to get and I want to see if they're getting it or not, basically. And so, you know, most of the time, they get it. And I can tell there's... It's a very interesting. When there's one clear answer, there's always a few that answer every other. Exactly. <laughs> Even though they may be very wrong. Yeah. And then yesterday, they there was one question. The answers were all over the place. And I had forgotten to tell them a key point. Whoops. Uh, you know? That's, that's cool. So it keeps me <laughs> on my toes. I say, oops, I forgot this. And we go back and I explain it. So I really like this. It's free and it is really easy to use. So if you are teaching or doing any kind of audience stuff where you want some feedback. Very nice. Uh, check that's this cool. Out. Yeah. And I must say, you know, I have this year 195 students uh, in my oh, it's class. It's still growing. And um, it, most years after the first few lectures, about half of them no longer come because I record my lectures and put them online. This year... Many more are staying because they like this question nice. business. They like the fact that nice, I'm telling nice, them what's important, nice. and they I think they enjoy doing it. It's a lot right. of fun, right? You right. pick sure. up your phone and you answer a question. Sure, sure. So, Socrative.com. There are others, but Neat. I I pick this one. It works. Neat. And uh, there you go. And as you heard, we had a couple of listener picks, so uh, check those out as well. And that is two seven one on the Twifster number two hundred seventy one. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Can't wait to 300. Yeah, I was thinking about that today. <laughs> when and will I was 300 thinking, We really be? need to get together. We do. We you, know? do. you know, maybe that should be our 300th. We all get together sure. and sure. Yeah. do a twist. You bet, you bet, you bet. And Dix is going to cook us dinner, right? You bet. Yes. Oh, I would love to do that. That would be great. We'll videotape it, right? Yeah. Done. Yeah, let's do that. Um, what day would that come out to if well, we did them consecutively? I'll come to New York. I got no problem with so that. So it is... Um, 30 more <clears throat> twins. 30, 30 weeks. Um, 30 weeks. 30 weeks. It's like it's rough. October, yeah. November. Oh, it's really in the fall, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Good. It gets time to plan. Fantastic. Yeah. I will meet somewhere and we'll have a studio. We'll do it. We'll do it. It could be that. So I could get ASM <coughs> to uh, let us do it there and they've got the studio set up and we could record it and... Mm stuff that would be fun so that's uh, a great idea i'll start planning the yeah meal. so that's going to be that's going to be like early september maybe that's right yeah okay uh so it would be everybody the whole twiv team love yeah. it and what are we going to talk about oh whatever we want we'll yeah. find something. if we can what, still talk what, we'll <laughs> what, what do we ever talk about that's yeah, right that's whatever right. we want right? everything and anything that's true it would be fun to do because you know, we've never all been together on video right, right? yeah that's right. Be great It'd that's be right. fun that's right that's right Number 300, wow. What about 1,000? What are we going to do then? Oh, I'm going to be dead. You're no, gonna, you're not. You're going to exhume no? me and well, we'll you're be... You're going to be frozen and uh, pulverized, right? Pro right. You're Prop be, us up. We'll have a little jar of powder there. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, that's right. Oh, that's good. We're going to put a jar and say this is rich content. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. No, the, the, we'll, we'll have sequences what comes of out, you, can, you can keep the pellet. <laughs> I, I was, I was going to throw it out in the biohazard wow. trash, but you guys can keep the pellet. That's right. Oh, yeah, we'll put your sequences online of all your virome. Good. <laughs> nice. Lord. What about Maybe, you, Dixon? Put you no, in a jar, same. too? No, Not do the same. I think all of us should be sequenced. <laughs> okay. Sure. That will be the heritage of TWIV, our sequences. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, look out the window, Vince. Oh, what do you call that kind of it's helicopter? a Huey, a big Huey. The, 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 can you hear the thumping? It's a double-propellered... Uh, yeah. Transport. Oh, that's a Chinook. A Chinook. Chinook. Oh, sorry. Chinook. Take, it back. Chinook. Take it back. Take it back. It's it for troop transport? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's an air base up the Hudson, right? Apparently. What's it called? 
I forgot. But there's one up there, I know. All right, Plattsburgh. That's, it's in Plattsburgh. Plattsburgh, that's right. Way up, though. That's way up. Where do you think it's going? That, no, it's not going that far. No? No, I don't think so. Okay. Twiv271, you can find it at iTunes and at twiv.tv. If you like us... <laughs> that's great we, we love you too <laughs> <laughs> go over to iTunes and leave a comment or a rating that helps to keep us visible among all those podcasts there so that people find out how really cool this world of virology is get it from the horse's mouth virology and send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv Dixon de Pommier is at verticalfarm.com medicalecology.com and trichinella.org Thank you, Dixon. You're welcome. It's a pleasure. I hope you feel better. I feel fine. I just sound lousy. I, whatever. Just I, get I better. I feel good. I feel good. You know, those viruses can make you sick. This is all true. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida in Gainesville. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Great time. Where it's always warmer than it is here. <laughs> Although we know you did your duties. Yeah. Alan Dove is at Alan Dove. No, he's not. He's at turbidplaque.com. I'm he's, also at alandove.com, but turbidplaque.com is my science blog. It's the science blog. And he's also on Twitter, and he will respond if you tweet him. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. I am Vincent Yellow, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>